Okay. Well, we're on live now, and unfortunately, folks, we can't. In fact, I'm going to hang you up, Angela, because because it's creating echo. Oh, you can hear me, right? Okay. Um, un unfortunately, we can't get audio from from Angela for today's uh, broadcast on flirting. Uh, if anyone has any any ideas about how we could get Angela's audio, she seems frozen currently on video too. We've been struggling here for about fifteen minutes. Can you hear me, Angela? Hello. I don't even know if she can hear me, and her face is just totally frozen on the screen. So I, th so I think what I'm going to do is just end today's broadcast and, and apologize f for that, and we'll re reschedule with, with, with Angela on flirting. And uh, I was really, really looking forward to it because Angela's got awesome uh, material. And uh, next week we're going to have... Kyle Jones, are you available next week, Angela? Well, you can't even hear me and vice versa. So we'll either have Angela next week or, or I'll be with Kyle Jones next week again on, on flirting. The, the whole uh, idea behind this is that there's two levels to, to intimacy, really. One, which I've been talking about with Jill Levitt and Mike, Mike Christianson, has to do with how to develop close loving relationships when you're in conflict with, with somebody how to receive criticism, how to give criticism, and we had many more really cool topics along those lines. But what if you don't have anyone to have a conflict with? That, then that's where flirting and dating strategies are very important. And when I was in clinical practice, 60% of my patients were not involved in intimate relationships and they found very valuable uh, the the flirting training, uh, the d dating strategies, how how to develop uh, dating relationships with with a, a lot of a lot of people, and uh, and and at any rate, that that's what I was gonna gonna bring you uh, here. Uh, Lisa, you're asking some questions. Angela, can you hear? Uh, I see Angela now. Tr Lisa Kelly says, try starting over. So here's Angela again, and I'll bring her up into the show. Uh, oh, I can hear you now, Angela. Hi. Hi. That's amazing. Who I'm is so that? Happy. Who, oh, that's you. Yeah, okay. Angela How did you get it to work, Angela? Huh? Uh, well there, there was a setting I missed when I got on that it, you know, it said connect camera, and then I noticed if I clicked a setting button, it gave me an option to play with the audio. So I'm so sorry. I guess that was totally my fault. I'm not, not, uh, not stellar at all these things, but I'm really excited. Looks like this will work out. Well, awesome that that we got off to a, to a rugged, horrible start, <laughs> and so the rest can't help but be a thousand times better. Let me introduce my. Yes. Dear friend and, and beloved esteemed colleague, Dr. Angela Crum. Angela is the clinical director of the Feeling Good Institute in Mountain View and uh, has been a longtime member of the, of the Tuesday group, except a few years later she went with Orr Katz and Jill Levitt and, and several other dear colleagues to form the actual Brick and Mortars Feeling Good Institute. For years to have a Feeling Good Institute was just a fantasy in my mind and now it's, it's, it's a reality. And Angela has graciously agreed to join us today to talk about, I think, an incredibly important topic, which usually isn't covered in psychiatric residency training programs or clinical psychology mm -hmm. programs. And and the reason it, I think it's so important is because I was raised as, as a minister's son, and I was taught that you're just supposed to be real polite to everyone and real serious. And I discovered that that mindset was not at all effective uh, in, in dating. And uh, I, I, I got nothing but shot down over and over and over again and eventually I felt I met, met a fellow named Michael I won't say his last name uh, but he, he he was just wildly successful in the dating arena he, he kind of took me under his arm and and taught me the ropes and it was really a life-changing experience and 
I skipped a lot of medical school classes to go out hustling with, with Michael and uh, <laughs> I had amazing adventures, some of which I wrote about in my book, Intimate Connections, although it's very, very toned down. My editor said I, it was way too wild and it would ruin my reputation. So I, I kind of revised the, the book. But with no further ado, let me introduce uh, Angela and we'll dive in. Now we're going to go ahead and present, Angela's going to present some uh, really cool topics on flirting. Type in your questions uh, and then 15 minutes before the end of, of today's show, we'll, we'll, we'll take your questions. But uh, hello Yehuda, hello John Para, Ber Bernie, thank you and for your wonderful email earlier. Bernie and Phil, hello, and Lisa, thank you for being here, supporting us, cheering us on, Veronica, and, and uh, oh, and Rob De, De Gregorio, my my number one fan in the whole world, and uh, that's who I'm uh, devoting my new book, Feeling Great To, is Rob D. Uh, Gregorio, and the other person I'm, de I'm uh, dedicating it to is my beloved late cat, Obi, Obi Burns. So take it away, Angela. Hello. Okay, awesome. Okay. It's so, I also will add my hellos and thank yous to all those folks and everyone else. Yeah, as David mentioned, I think we're going to try to keep most of the Q&A towards the end because we've gotten some feedback that maybe it's a little distracting when we're, you know, making some talking points and then bouncing off the comments. So we'll, we'll see. I, I don't know that we'll contain ourselves entirely if there's something that feels really relevant, but we'll, we'll kind of do our best with that. Um, but I'm super excited to join you all today. I also feel a little nervous. I just like to share that with folks when that's real for me. Um, it's a new platform to do the Facebook Live for me. Um, and I always feel a little silly when people see me as a flirting expert. Um, it used to just feel like awesome when people would say that. And now I've been married about I don't know what seven years. years. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Uh, no, it's much less than that. Six or seven years. Um, you know, I have two little kids, and I, um, and when folks will say that, I feel a little silly. Like I, I, first, I always have the thought of, oh, I'm out of practice, and then actually, I remember that I do still flirt all the time because I, I think of flirting as really just advanced social skills that we use to connect with folks, um, with any any people, whether we're interested in them intimately or not. So last night I was at a party for my niece's uh, middle school graduation and didn't know very many people there because it was her friend's parents. And I said to my husband as we walked in the door, I was like, oh, here's an opportunity to do my flirting skills. And at the end of the night, my sister-in-law says to me, thank you so much. You kept that party going because no one knew each other and it was so awkward. And, and I kind of laughed and thought, yeah, that's a good reminder that even for those of you today who may be thinking, oh, I don't need to flirt. I'm too old or I'm too X or I'm too Y, you know, whatever your reasons are. The truth is we connect with people when we use some of these skills and we meet new people and we engage and we learn to go deeper. So I, I hope you can think with us today kind of broadly about the application, even though most of the examples I will use are really related to kind of the, the intimacy building when we think of more classic flirting. Um, so, so maybe, you know, I mentioned to David that I'd, I'd love to share a little bit about kind of why am I the person talking about this today? Um, I, I was a clinician who always enjoyed treating all of the social anxiety spectrum types of struggles. So I always enjoyed social skills training, um, shyness, social anxiety. And so I'd always been someone who uh, enjoyed learning and practicing these skills. And I actually had been, um, I would say that in like high school and college, I was a particularly bad flirter. Um, David talks about being raised as a minister's son. We have that in common. I was raised as a minister's daughter, actually, um, and definitely didn't have training in any of this. And as I look back, if I have any you know, high school friends watching this today, they're probably laughing at the idea of me teaching this because I think the best I did was to like follow around boys who I liked and hope they would eventually pay attention to me. Um, and you know, it was sweet, I'm sure. Like, I, you know, I was probably likable enough. I was like a nice girl and maybe a little fun here and there, but mostly I was way too serious. And I had this theory that if I just was around them enough, they would decide they liked me. So 
I remember this one guy who was a couple years older than me in my older sister's class. And I would constantly ask him to for a ride home because I was so convinced that if he just hung out with me enough, he would like me. And of course, all I was doing was like annoying the crap out of this guy who really didn't want to be driving this little freshman home, you know, and wasn't interested. And I had no idea that like the chasing behaviors that I was engaging in, this idea of follow them around until they decide you're cool was not cool at all and was actually you know, following what what we believe very strongly in Team CBT is that when we chase someone in any way, we force them to run away from us. So given that, I had had a lot to learn. And to be honest, college wasn't much better. I, I can think of examples where I had a similar pattern of, you know, being interested in someone and just becoming overly um, present in their lives. Like if I showed up enough in their spaces thinking that that would work. Um, so it took much later in life. I actually, um, most folks within the Team CBT community know that I then was married young and then divorced young. And that was my turnaround point because the divorce was, I was actively attending the Tuesday group and David and I were having a lot of conversations about my own insecurities, about whether I could get out there again, right? And what would it mean mean to be this woman who was just divorced and how would I find people um, to date and to be interested in? And so, of course, I was reading David's amazing book, Intimate Connections, and I've teased him relentlessly. It's pretty dated. There are examples of in the book of taking out ads in newspapers. So, you know, we can all have a good chuckle at that being a little dated. It's um, dated. So, I'm but, not dated, but my book is no, dated. <laughs> not you, David. You're perfectly hip and up to date. Um, but yeah, we can all agree that we aren't taking out classifieds. But, you know, the application is the same of the book, right? So you replace take out the ad in the newspaper with swipe right or left on Tinder. And the concepts are the same, right? And one of the primary concepts that we'll talk about today um, and is really the spirit of our approach to inviting people to connect with you and be close to you is this concept of not chasing people, right? Is be, being able to be someone who can um, put out some confident energy, whether you're faking it or not, but not give in to the, the chase that we do when we feel the desperation to hold on to someone, right? And so you'll hear as we talk about the skills, the theme of how do you not chase but still engage and remain open to connection? Um, and I'll use lots of, of fun examples from that period then after my divorce where I was single and not only was I reading Intimate Connections, but I was talking in the Tuesday group about these themes and these skills. Uh, Jacob Towery, a psychiatrist um, in the, the Bay Area here with us also, was working with us on these skills as well. And really the energy just started growing to this idea of like, let's get really good at this stuff. Let's figure it out. And then let's figure out how to teach it to other people, right? So I enjoy both training other therapists in how to do this as well as um, teaching clients how to do it, right? And again, clients not only who are wanting an intimate relationship, but clients who maybe just need friendships, right? They need these skills to just develop a new friend, right? And and to build from there. Um, so that's kind of like, I guess, the background I wanted to share. David, I'll, I'll be quiet for a minute and see what thoughts or reactions you have to that before we start to look at some of the specific skills that we'd be discussing. Well, I'm in 200% agreement with what you've what you've said so far. So let's let let let's forge ahead. I was also very nerdy when I was in medical school. I was still very nerdy, and there was this fellow. Uh, I, I I would live in different houses, uh, you know, rented houses in Menlo Park or Palo Alto or various places, and there was this really neat guy. He I think he was about 19, named Jeff Evans, who and he oh. would live in was living in the garage behind one of the houses I was renting. He called himself Spider. And he played the drums. And he was a really good-looking, cool guy. But I was incredibly nerdy, and he was incredibly shy. And so one day, I just decided to not go to medical school classes for two weeks. And he and I just decided to go around asking women for for dates. Okay. And he was as much as a loser as I was. I mean, he wasn't a loser. He was really a handsome, cool, awesome, neat guy. He was a drummer. But he was just very kind of insecure and nerdy as I was. And so we, we just, we walked up 
took turns, but I'd say like, go, go and see if you can get her phone number. And then he'd say, go and see if you can get her phone number. We walked around Palo Alto and New York for two weeks and we each got rejected about 200 times in a row. <laughs> And we'd have zero successes, but it was helpful. And we now I call that rejection practice is getting over right. your fear of, of, of being re rejected. But I came from that same same background that there's an art form to flirting, to, to dating and, and to having people chase you rather than you, you chasing uh, uh, mm -hmm. other people. In fact, once I was on the Stanford, walking across the Stanford campus and this bearded guy came up and, and bumped into me. I'd never seen him before. And, and, and he says, you know your problem? And, and I said, no, no, what's my problem? And he says, you're always trying to grab the universe and it's always going to keep running away from you. Hmm. And, and you, you, you won't, your dreams won't come true until you learn to kind of sit with open hands and let the universe chase you. Wow. And then he, he walked off. But it was so true what he was saying. Hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, so both of us are kind of, um, well, definitely on board with that idea that we have to figure out how to um, engage without giving into that chase that was so present for me, at least, when I was first trying these skills. Um, so I thought, David, maybe we could start with just a, a little bit of thinking about some of the resistance issues that comes up for folks when we're teaching flirting skills. Sure. Because just like, you know, with anything we do within team therapy, we're never going to succeed if we're just throwing methods at people, right? And I definitely know this to be the case because there's a couple um, people in my personal life who I think are doing it all wrong with the flirting. And I notice once in a while I'll make some suggestions and they just kind of balk at them. You know, there's this sense of like, oh, I wouldn't do that. It's so fake or it's so oh, yeah. ingenuine right. or it, that's not me. And I, and each time it's so obvious, I don't have an agenda with these folks, meaning yeah. the team language I haven't worked through all the good reasons not to use these behaviors, right? And so it's a reminder to all of us, whether you're a therapist or, or someone else watching today, um, that there are a lot of good reasons not to learn these types of skills, right? To, to avoid it. And I thought maybe in the chat box, folks could share some reasons now that come up for them. Um, David, maybe you can help me with the multitasking if there's any you wanna read out loud. Um, but I think there, there's one kind of main one I, I hear most often from the clients that I work with. But I'm wondering if others can can throw out some ideas they might have. What would be good reasons not to try new flirting skills? Why would you not want that? Or even what good things might it say about you that you're someone who doesn't want to have to like see flirting as a skill you have to build? Well, I can. I, I know one that I heard all yeah. the time when I was in practice, just to get the people on the list warmed up. By the way, yeah. two people on the list of are saying that you look beautiful. Oh, that's so sweet! I love it. You think Say they're more. flirting with you? <laughs> I bet they are. Um, one, one. I had patients, particularly. I got this from male patients more than from female patients. Oh but, wait, David, uh, did we did we get shut down for a minute? Lisa just said we'll be on momentarily. Is that? Uh, no, I don't know. We're, we're on okay. now. Okay. Maybe that okay. was old earlier okay. in the broadcast. Okay. Yeah. But uh, Adara says you'll you'll feel stupid. Uh, okay. Erica says uh, I will be I will be shamed. Oh, here's my little flirty kitty. Oh, yes, keep my kitty, Misty. Or my little kitty. She comes up. She flirts with me. This is what you're going to explain about rubbing up against my <laughs> legs. And then she then she runs off. So so she's un unavailable. So I have to chase her. She, she uh, playing she's, hard you know, to get. Uh, yeah, Jason says I think she's beautiful. Oh, too. that's my husband is on here now. Oh, that's Jason. Oh my goodness. Well, you see, the flirting works because I can I, tell you that uh, uh, the. Uh, uh, so, I'm blushing husband. that he got on here. I'm so embarrassed. He is, is a <laughs> handsome hunk. He he's, is pretty he's, cute. He's yeah. awesomely uh, good looking, <laughs> muscular guy, and a really nice, smart, neat, neat guy. So the, what <laughs> Angela's going to teach you here today works. Ber Bernie says, I'm afraid of offending others, and, and mm -hmm. I have a rejection phobia. So you need my rejection uh, practice, uh, Bernie. Uh, let's see if there's others. Uh, 
somebody says, love, love your energy, love, love the stories. Uh, Jonathan says, you know how uncomfortable it is? Oh, man, if a girl likes me and realizes I don't know what I'm doing, it'll be too scary. That's a good one. Mm -hmm. And then the one I got all the time when I was in practice is, is you know, I had these guys that looked like crap. I, I, I hate to say yeah. it, but they dress shabby, they look shabby. And 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 then then they and I was saying you need to change the way you look and and change the way you uh, communicate with, with with women and sometimes you have to play the game a little bit when you're getting to know someone and then they would say oh no I don't want to be a phony women should like me the way I am right and then I said why should they like you the way you are you look like shit <laughs> <laughs> excuse me you had to have a good relationship with a patient to say that and then I would right. send them to this woman at the King of Prussia Mall, Kaniko Finkelstein, who I met, who worked in Bloomingdale's, and she was Philadelphia's top fashion expert. She was a super genius. And I would say, if you want me to help you with your flirting with women and make your turn your love life from rags to riches, then you have to go and make an appointment and go see uh, Kaniko Finkelstein in the men's department of the Bloomingdale's and tell her Dr. Burns referred you for a sex uniform. And she will dress you in the most beautiful clothing. She has, she's going to pick out everything, a totally integrated outfit. She'll pick out your underpants, your socks, your <laughs> shoes, your pants, your belt, your shirt, your vest, everything. And she'll turn you into a, a male lollipop. <laughs> <laughs> and I think that's one of the first things you were going to comment oh, on yeah. is, is your appearance. But, but one of the resistance things was women should yeah. like me the way I right. am. Yeah, uh, right. I shouldn't have to change. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's that's the one, David, that you just nailed, the kind of the main one I hear. And it, maybe not as specifically just about what folks are wearing, but the idea that we shouldn't have to change um, anything about ourselves to find a loving partner. And I actually, um, there's a huge part of me that agrees with that wholeheartedly. I want folks, and I will talk with thing. clients and therapists about the idea that I absolutely want them to be themselves, right? I am not in the business of making you someone different. This isn't like in the movies where you see a flirting coach who's going to revamp you and make you lie and be someone you're not. But there is a truth that there is something a little naive of us or maybe even kind of that ego coming up if we think that we shouldn't have to try at all. Right. And, and a, a lot of folks will fall into that camp. I shouldn't have to do anything. And then really what that means is they have a very passive sense of waiting for the, the ideal partner to magically show up on their doorstep and ring the doorbell and, you know, welcome you with loving arms without you putting any effort out there. So I'm a big fan of saying, great, we don't have to change who we are at the core, but everything um, in life that has a lot of value often takes a little risk, right? It takes putting ourselves out there. And so, um, so, you know, with all of you who are listening today, if you strongly believe you shouldn't have to do anything, then that's okay. Then these aren't the right skills for you, right? And David and I can sit with open hands. We don't need to try to convince you today or chase you to get you to try these things. Um, and we don't want you to chase your clients and try to convince them. We want you to actually do the opposite, like we talk about in team therapy, of sitting with open hands and let folks decide if they want this. So what we'll do next is I'll run you through some of my favorite tips. We won't get to all of them. Over time, there's a list that um, I've, I've sort of honed in on that pull from intimate connections and from other conversations in the uh, the team community that turned into like 13 skills. And when I sit down with a client, I'll hand them that list and have them decide which might feel like a good fit for them, right? It's not a kind of black and white concept that everyone needs to do the same thing, but more of an attitude of, hey, these are things that could be helpful to you. Let's look at which ones you might um, want to try to implement into your skill set, and we'll go from there. So I'll hit you with a few of my favorites today. And then again, I, I want to make sure we save some time for practice. Um, does I that feel okay, to, David, if I jump? Just okay. say real quick here, people yeah. came up with a lot more resistances, and uh, okay. I need to get yeah. in shape first. Uh, one woman said, I'll look like a Jezebel. You know, they'll think I'm shameless if I go around flirting. Right. Uh, Julie says it seems manipulative. Yep. 
uh, you know, all of these, you're doing a good job, people. And then two asked, if, is Kaneko Finkelstein still there? I would go check it out. Two people from Philadelphia asked, and if she's still there, tell her I still love her, and I'm still talking about her 25 years later, because she is right. she is a, like a, a Mozart of fabric and clothing. Anyway, back to you, Angela. Awesome. Yeah, but you know, the truth is that people probably know this, I'm probably stating the obvious, but most most department stores will do the same for you. It, yeah. You don't need this amazing woman. There's there's amazing um, people at every store and every boutique. They, they work on commission. They'd love to help you find things that look good and be excited about it, right? Um, but so let's look at some of the, the ones that I think are, are most important and ones that really are super important for meeting people in general. So there's, there's two I'll tell you about that I often have clients practice as a pair. Um, one we call false time constraints and the other we call creating openers, right? So false time constraints I'll talk about. That's one we'll talk about and then um, openers, okay? Um, and let me tell you a little story first and then we'll see if we can pick out the skills from within the story. I think this was one of my most artful moments. I've told you some bad ones. Now here comes uh, one I feel really proud of. So um, there was a girlfriend of mine from Indiana who um, – when after my divorce used to come out and visit me all the time and we she also was single at the time and i think having a partner in crime is awesome so if you don't have anyone to go flirt with think about using these skills first to increase your friend network right then the see that as step one ease in right and then the, the flirting will get easier if you have some partners to just go out with right and be be in public spaces so um, so this friend and I had a lot of fun. We were playing with these techniques. We were going in with a lighthearted attitude of not feeling attached to the outcome. You know, as David talked about, we were willing to be rejected. So there wasn't a lot of stakes at stake. We were just interested in being playful and having conversations. So one night we were in a bar and she saw these two guys walk in who were totally her type, right? And, and not everyone has a type. This friend of mine happened to have a certain type of man she found very attractive and was very interested in. So they walked in and there was a lot of people in this bar. And, you know, we both had the thought of like, oh, it'd be kind of hard to get their attention because they were pretty attractive. My guess is they could have had their pickings of the room. So I thought about this idea of the false time constraint and the opener and said, well, just let's go walk, walk with me and let's, let's head towards the bathroom and let's see what happens. And she's like, what are you going to do? And I said, I'm not sure yet, but let's, you know, follow me and let's, let's see what happens here. So we walk up in front of these guys and I, I just paused right in front, front of them. And my opener was, oh, I just gave you the answer. I told you, you had to pull out the skills. I'm helping you too much. But my opener was something like, Hey, could you guys just, um, just pretend to talk to us for a minute. Now, of course, I have their attention because what does that mean to pretend to talk to someone, right? So they're, they, it definitely pulled their attention. They're, they start going, what do you mean? It's like, we just need a minute, okay? Just give me a second. Just stand here and you don't even have to say anything. Just kind of nod your head a little bit. And I'm kind of looking over my shoulder like, like I'm checking out something going on behind me, right? And now they're really intrigued because they're like, what's going on here? And my friend's just starting to like giggle, kind of nervous, laughing. She doesn't know what's going on either. And so finally they're, they're like pushing me for an answer. And I say something like, oh, we just need, we, we just need you to be kind of a decoy. We were kind of caught up with this awkward conversation. We needed to get away. So I, it's probably enough. We're probably safe now. We could we could move on, right? And of course, they're like, no, 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 because now they're really intrigued, right? So now they're leading the conversation and I'm kind of off the hook, right? So they're going, well, who were you talking to? What was going on? And suddenly we have this really humorous conversation ensuing. I'd made the whole thing up. There was no one we had to get away from. But what I'd done is created an opener, just a way to open up a conversation with the false time constraint. Right? So the false time constraint part is saying, I just need a moment, right? And think for a minute, why is that appealing in a flirting situation? Because maybe your gut says, oh, I want to sit down and have a two hour in depth, you know, deep, meaningful conversation with this person. So why would Angela be saying, suggest it's going to be just a minute, right? What is that that's appealing? Um, the, the answer, as you think about it, is something along the lines of it's low pressure for them right? They don't feel wrapped in. And it has the spirit of that chase because I convey a willingness to walk away, 
right? My saying, I just need a minute, I'm just kind of using you even for a minute to get away from something else, made it playful and fun. And the stakes were low for them. They didn't have to figure out how to get out of this conversation because I had already mentioned, I just need a minute of your time, right? So false time constraints, we teach, I teach to clients, even if we're walking down the street, let's say you're going to ask someone, you see someone you're attracted to and you're walking down the street of your little downtown, wherever you live, and an opener might be to ask for a recommendation, right? To say something like, oh, I, you know, I was hoping to get some coffee. Do you have a place you like around here? We can add the false time constraint by saying, do you have just a minute? Or, oh, I just need a second of your time, right? And what that does is it helps folks to engage with you without feeling trapped. Does that make sense? So those are two of my favorites, false time constraint and openers. David, what do you think about those? What are your reactions to that example or hearing about those two skills? Yeah, that, that's super. You know, I'll let you keep talking. I, I can always give more examples, but you've got yeah. so much great information to convey. That's that that sounds that sounds great. What do you mm -hmm. say to the person who says, "Oh, that's fake. I don't want to give some fake, you know, technique like this." Yeah, it was fake. That was a totally made up one, and it rocked. Like it totally worked. Right. Like right. my friend was so excited. We ended up hanging out with them all night. Like we actually couldn't get rid of them then, you know, later. But she had a lot of fun with them, and it, you know, we went to like two or three other spots with them that evening. And, you know, she stayed in touch with one of the guys. It was fine. Um, so yeah, I totally lied that time. And I don't usually advocate line, but occasionally it's one of those moments of like, well, really, what what's the harm in that? You know, it was just playful and silly. Um, but for folks where it feels important to never be fake, which is fine, I respect that, find something genuine that creates an opener, right? So again, I mentioned yep. asking for recommendations is like a really simple, common social skill that we teach folks, whether they're trying to flirt or just get over social anxiety. So, you know, genuinely put yourself in a situation where you need recommendations or ideas, you know, sit down at the counter at a restaurant and ask the person next to you for a recommendation of their favorite food or, you know, walk by, go window shopping and stand in front of a window. And when someone walks by, ask their opinion about something you see in the window, right? They can be simple and genuine, you know, go to a place you genuinely care about and you'll be able to find plenty of, of openers that are real, right? Today we were, uh, sometimes you can do kind of silly things and engage with people too. I yeah. think part of flirting is that people want to play. They, they want to have a lighthearted interaction, not all this serious stuff. And after our mm -hmm. hike today, uh, Mark Noble show, showed up. He's a, a neuroscientist from Rochester and the father of stem cell genetics and, you know, this world famous person. And, but he's real interested in Team CBT. And by the way, he's coming Tuesday to the group, Angela, if you or any of the people want to come. He has a new cool. brain model for how CBT affects the brain, how Team yeah. does, which was cool. But we went to Dim Sum afterwards uh, mm -hmm. and had fun. And then we went and got these, you know, tea, uh, sweet tea things that were they're like slushies. Bubble tea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And when we were in there, the last time we were in there, we did shame attacking exercises. And I made Mark sing for these uh kids and it was bizarre but everyone liked it so this time there were three young asian people there a woman and two guys and they just ordered their drinks and we were all waiting for our drinks i said oh you you people you you may have heard of mark you've probably seen this fellow on television he's a, he's a famous singing star or do, do you are do you recognize him they said no we, we don't really so well he he would like to serenade you now now mark didn't know that i was <laughs> wow. gonna, gonna do this and then he 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 pretended to sing. He said, I'm going to sing this three-minute song in nine seconds, compressed, and I'm going to do it in total silence. So he said, uh, let, 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 here, here we go. We're going to sing, and David's going to help me. And then we pretended to be singing, and then they caught on, and they pretended to be singing, and everyone was kind of laughing, and then they called it our our kind of green tea Slurpees were ready, but like they, they bought right into what we were doing and they, we were having sure. fun, you see, yeah. and they realized we weren't trying to put a move on them or anything like that. It just yeah. having, having lighthearted fun and the world is filled with magic. And part of the idea is when you get out of your shell and start connecting with, with people without grabbing on onto people that, that you can have, have fun. And that's, that's part of the secret of, of sex appeal really is to right. interact with people in a kind of fun, fun lighthearted way.
Yeah. And I kind of like it when you're kind of playing games with people because there's something uh, when you're doing a silly little game like what you said, Angela, it all of a sudden it, it's a fun, silly thing that you're doing. It's not this, yeah. oh, take me. Uh, can we make babies now? <laughs> I, I need to get married or or, or whatever. It, yeah. it puts it in a whole different, different right. dimension. And that other dimension is kind of where sex appeal uh, happens. Right. Absolutely. I went, I'm i laughing because I wonder if my husband's still listening or not. He'd popped on and complimented me at one point because we'll, we should tell a couple stories about meeting Jason then. Because um, this theme of being playful and not taking it too seriously is really tough for folks, especially uh, I imagine a lot of the people listening today are therapists. And I think in general, we are folks who like deep, meaningful interaction. Right? Yeah. So often we're actually not good at, at chit chat, lighthearted surface level stuff because we connect with like depth and vulnerability, right? And I am absolutely that way. Like I want deep, meaningful connections and I don't feel terribly drawn into kind of chit chat gets boring real quickly. Jason said, yep. So he's still listening. So let's tell a Jason story. But given that, um, you know, I think that the answer to going from chit chat to deeper is to be patient with it right? That you have every right to have deep, intimate, vulnerable relationships, but you don't have to always have that in your first moment of interaction with someone. So I hope that you'll want to hold on to those deep, meaningful parts, but kind of ease into them, right? So one of the skills on the list that that is important is this idea of exiting the interaction early. And that helps us um, balance that that desire to chase and to go deep too quick, right? So when I say exit the interaction early, I literally mean don't be the person at the dinner party when who's holding on when the host wants to go, wants to have you go, right? Don't stick with things beyond the point of fun and entertainment and to the point that everyone's bored and just remembering the end of the night being kind of tedious and boring, right? So this applies whether it's a first casual chat with someone you've approached, like you're on the street asking for a recommendation, you wanna keep it brief, right? You wanna convey a willingness to move on and to walk away so that they want more, right? It applies if you're at the dinner party with friends, you want your friends to want you to come back and that means you wanna leave before they're sick of you right? You want the first date to end on a good note, not on those notes where you're like, oh, what else are we supposed to talk about now? This is so boring, right? We've run out of everything. So you want to have the energy of like when the energy turns towards negative move on, right? So this worked pretty well with with my dear husband, who's again listening. Um, But so Jason and I did meet at a bar. I I was on a night of being flirty and I literally pointed at him as he walked in and said to my friend, that guy is really attractive. And then I turned away from him and paid no attention to him. But I sure as hell made sure he'd seen me do that. Right. So I made it pretty darn easy on Jason to approach me later because it opened a door for him to come to me later and be like, so what was that about? Right. And then I got to be kind of coy and be like, I don't I don't know what you're talking about. I wasn't pointing at you. Right. And it just kind of teasing was the beginning. Well, what happened then is I wasn't ready to be in a serious relationship. I was still having fun. (laughs) But Jason was this like really cool guy. Right. So we met for dinner the next night and. I used a couple of the other skills, which we won't have time to get to today, but I kept remembering the exit, the interaction early. And the reason it was so important was because I really, really liked him, right? Like I really liked him and I knew that all of my normal tendencies would be, let's hang out again. When can I see you again? when can I call you? How can I get to know you more? Right. So I played it hard. Like I I really set limits with it. I would not agree to see him all the time. And it created this really awesome dynamic that even got talked about, like in the, in the toasts at our wedding, my sisters were joking that, that I kept playing the card of, oh, we're just friends. We're just friends. I was totally into him, but I was really holding back because I knew that if I rushed it, I'd probably ruin it. 
right? I'd probably come across as like too desperate, too needing to hold on. And so the willingness to let go was was really key, right? And it, it forced him into a role of kind of chasing me more, right? Where he then was the one saying, when can I see you again? And I'd say, oh, and I'd just say it kind of coyly and playfully. I'd say, well, I, I, have, a, I have a twice a week limit with you. Like I, I, if I've seen you tonight, you got to wait five more days because that's just too much for us, right? And he'd laugh. And then of course he'd call me the next day and be like, are you sure? What if we go to this really good spot to eat. And I'd be like, oh, I don't know, you know, and I'd just play with it. It was so fun, right, to be able to do it. But genuinely, I think it was the smartest thing I did in our relationship because it slowed us down. It helped us to move at a pace that we really could get to know each other, right? Um, but at the surface level, the initial interactions, that exit is important. So what I teach clients is, you know, do an opener with a time limit and then walk away but leave yourself in a space that they can approach you later, right? So let's take let's take this out of a bar and into like a work function. Let's imagine you're at a conference, okay? And it's like folks are doing that awkward networking thing. They're supposed to move around the room, but everyone's actually just awkwardly standing here with a plate wishing there was someone to talk to them. So I'm going to approach a group of someone that I would like to connect with. I'm going to use an opener with a false time constraint, and then I'm gonna move on, but I'm gonna stay in the room, right? And probably, if I really am interested in the person, I'm going to make sure I keep scanning the room, right? That's an eye contact is important, to make myself kind of look available and approachable, but I'm not gonna linger around that person all, all day at the conference, right? I'm just going to exit early, and then they need to make the next move of having some, conveying some interest, okay? So it puts me in the position of I'm okay, you're welcome to come to me if you want, but I'm not going to follow you around all day and chase you. Um, so that's the combo of some of the, um, you know, thinking about eye contact, but also really, really working on that idea of exiting early, which I think is the hardest thing for folks to learn. Um, it's the same with text messages and online dating too, right? We have to figure out how to kind of exit, meaning put an end to it, um, you know, not, I don't teach hard, fast rules. The, all the internet will tell you, like, wait three days to respond. I think all that's silly. You can't be that rigid with it. But the spirit of it is that we want to convey we still have other things in our life and we're not desperately waiting around for this person to fulfill all of our needs. Um, the, the, so the, the idea behind this, there's something I wrote about an intimate connection called, called the Burns Rule, but it's been around for thousands of years and it's probably been around since the origin of the universe and it's people only want what they can't get and they never want what they can get and so I think that's why you're, you're saying you know make an early exit show interest but make yourself somewhat un unavailable because if you chase the other person and if you need the other person you're what they can get and so you will force them to reject you. Mm -hmm. Uh, if, if, as long as you're in the chasing role or the needy role, you're, you're guaranteed to turn turn other other people off. And it mm -hmm. and this not only rule dominates and explains all dating behavior. It's you know in business and and, and all in all human interactions, we seem to chase some something we we, we can't get. And mm -hmm. where there's something we can get, someone who's real available, then you think, oh, that person, I don't that, that he's needy or she's needy. You know that that person's real, real uninteresting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's an art though, because again, we want to be deep and meaningful and connected. And again, I'll reiterate: I think you can for sure. I think I want that for you too. I surely want that in my own relationships. But we don't have to do that from day one, right? We can ease into that and and balance are you, it. Are you saying people have to learn to play games? <laughs> I would never use that language, David. I don't teach game playing. Uh, <laughs> I, is that a I yes? do teach <laughs> sort of. <laughs> sort of a little bit. Yeah. No, but I, I don't I don't like to think of it as games because I don't think I'm asking people to do things that are really manipulative. I, I think I'm asking them to bring out their best self, right? Their most confident, assured self and to take some risks. So um, but we should take some questions because I think we do we have a hard stop at four usually, right? So we need to give the audience some time for questions. Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily a hard stop. Okay, at four, okay. But uh, and generally we stop at four, but we can mm -hmm. stop and ask questions, or you can go give give a couple more kind of a, of your tips. Let, let mm -hmm. me ask a question for okay. the for the audience. Let Let's mm -hmm. say that you use some kind of you know opener and and time constraint. How do you get from that to more more of a you know a, 
a conversation with, with, with the person like, uh, like what restaurants you like, like around here? Oh, you like uh, McDonald's. Great. Then, then what? Right. Yeah. So, so the skills that move it along there um, were developed by this really amazing guy named David Burns. Oh, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, we, we call that uh, the David Letterman technique, which we, we probably need an updated term for that too, because soon the new generations won't know who that is, but that the talk show host concept includes a whole skill set of ways that we actually put the spotlight on the other person and get them talking. And so obviously we wouldn't have time to teach them in depth, but to highlight them, it's things like stroking, which really means genuine compliments for the other person, um, open-ended questions that really take an interest in anything the other person has said, right? Um, and, and those combo, um, so it's inquiry, right, which these open-ended questions and, and stroking primarily um, that keep the focus on the other person, which is really stellar, especially for the folks who feel kind of anxious talking to new people because it takes the pressure off us to say wise things. Um, last month I went out with, I, I teach a Thursday morning training group locally for folks in the Bay Area, and we went out and did some flirting practice on the streets downtown here. And there was this, um, I was, you know, sort of asked to demonstrate this part, like how do you get someone talking beyond the recommendation? And so this man had walked out of the of like a, a building just in front of us and I stopped him and I started with a compliment. My opener was a compliment. I said something like, oh, you look like a guy who probably um, knows all the cool spots because you look at your hip shoes or something like that, right? And he had on these like cool baby blue shoes or something. And, and he just immediately perked up. He was just like, whoa, like I could tell he was going to be eating out of my hand in a minute. And sure enough, so I just started with, oh, yeah, we just need a breakfast spot and we want something kind of cute and hip and local. And he started I, throwing out ideas. And then I just opened it up. I said, oh, do you are you are you like a native here? You seem to really know your way around. And he just starts talking about where he grew up and da, da, da. And he mentioned something about going up to Tahoe, which in California, that's like our beautiful mountain lake area, right? And I just jokingly say, ooh, a friend with a house in Tahoe. Now that's a friend I need, right? And at this point, he gets, he blushes and he starts to go, well, if you want it, well, I mean, maybe. And it's like he was debating whether to ask me to go to Tahoe with him. And at this point, I'm like hiding my wedding ring because it's like worked too well. You know, it's one of these like, oh, this got too successful too quickly and the, watch out jason <laughs> <laughs> the woman in my training group next to me was sort of like flabbergasted with like oh this is working really well so we we had a good laugh as we walked away then i had to use an exit right because all of a sudden i was in over my head so i had to use an exit of some compliments and wrapping it up and saying sweetly something about like oh i'll let you get on with your day you're a busy important person and you know we kind of moved on I have a quick, quick story to compliment yeah. you, perhaps. The, when I hung out with this fellow, Michael, I mean, he also worked in a men's clothing store. He lived with his mother. He rode around on a, a motor scooter. And, and yet he was the, you know, the hottest thing in Palo Alto. Women couldn't really, really resist him. And so, you know, he was trying to show me what I was doing wrong and what I was doing right. And it was it was the most amazing transformational experience. But he, mm -hmm. he took me in and he, he made me buy all these real fancy, beautiful looking clothes. And then also, you know, it's like what you're saying, be, be positive to the other person, because I was right. always, you know, being sincere and getting shot down. So I decided to to try his thing once. And there was this local bar on University Avenue in Palo Alto, and I, I, I determined, I stat, stood next to the door and, and said to myself, the next woman that comes in, I'm going to make a real nice, you know, compliment. Uh -huh. And I was just, I'll tell her she has a pretty blouse or something like that. So I was just, all I'm going to be real kind of positive and not my nerdy self. <laughs> and so the next group that came in was a group of Hell's Angels. They just parked their motorcycles and, you know, real mean looking guys. And they had this, I mean, I shouldn't use this language, but this hot babe with them. Am I allowed mm -hmm. to say things like that? Or does this movie <laughs> I don't know, but we'll, we'll let you, we'll let you get away with it. She was like maybe 19 years old and she was extremely well built and, and, and she was just wearing a t-shirt. 
a white t-shirt uh-huh. that I had in my mind I was going to tell her it's a pretty blouse right. <laughs> so I, I said to her oh that's really a nice blouse that you're wearing <laughs> which was totally idiotic and right. there are these hell's angels there sense, right? not realizing what I'm doing mm-hmm. and she walked up to me and she put her aunt arms around me and she started gyrating against me oh wow and she said oh you're so cute and then they walked off to, to, to the bar and i thought wow that's that's better than my usual my usual reception and again it kind of taught me that there there's something really nice about being kind of offbeat and and humorous and 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 not taking yourself so 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 seriously and i kind of think there's a kind of a a lightheartedness don't you think uh, angela yeah. to to effective flirting you're kind of having having fun with someone when you told this guy he had like real cute cute shoes i've sometimes mm-hmm. told women you may think this is uh, wrong angela but like if you're flirting with a guy uh, and you're going to give them compliments, you have to tell them something that's not true or it'll be too heavy. Oh, mm-hmm. So if the guy is, is real handsome, but he looks like he has an IQ of, you know, 42, you look into his eyes and you say, you know, there's something about your eyes that are so intelligent. But mm-hmm. I, I'm sure you hear this from women all the time. And of course, he's never heard that because no one thinks, even his mother doesn't think he's intelligent. Mm-hmm. And it and it's really kind of appealing. And then, uh, and then like, let's say the guy is, uh, you know, has this, br- seems like he's uh, like owns Google or something. He's, he's some brilliant, uh, you know, genius IQ guy, but he's ugly as sin. You, you just tell him there's something about your eyes that is so attractive. But I, mm-hmm. I bet you hear this from women all the time. And then you're kind of blowing smoke in his face in, in a friendly way. And you're playing with them, mm-hmm. and, and and that that somehow is 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 kind of empowering and makes the woman very attractive to 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 that to that guy. Anyway, that's that's Burns's lame theory, but uh, yeah, I always feel mixed. So so in the community, folks will call that negs, like finding oh, yeah, negative, that's right. or yeah. um, on my mm-hmm. sheet, I'll I'll I list teasing gently. That's the hardest for me, David, because I think that it yeah, so yeah. often can be construed as mean spirited if done wrong. Oh, yeah, that's the truth with, truth with any of these hard. methods, right? Is that you know, any, you always yeah, say you our methods could be a scalpel and hurt if done wrong. So it's, it's the one that I think folks need to use most carefully, right? That they yeah, need to, you're right. um, you know, as a way to be respectful. But the, in the examples you gave, you know, if, if you're, if you genuinely think the person's eyes are beautiful, even though they're not an, maybe attractive to you otherwise, then great, compliment their eyes. That's very genuine, right? Yeah. Um, but I think it's just one that can be really effective and also can be, used to hurt if not done well so like anything you just want to use caution yeah Yeah, it's 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 to be joyful to be playful with people to have fun with people that's what people are yearning for right absolutely yeah so there can be really really um powerful ones if we can be playful and you know a lot of folks will say like i'm just not a playful silly person and i i I, I think we can all find it to some degree in ourselves if we want to, you know, but again, maybe there's good reasons not to do it, but I think we all have that, you know, we can dig deep to like, gosh, what was I like when I was seven and silly, <laughs> you know, when I didn't care yeah. so much what people thought of me and there wasn't so much pressure. Right. And then do we have, before we take, take question, just based on what you've said so far, we'll probably have to have a, a, a part two on your on your mm-hmm. flirting tips because we're only about a third of the way through them. Yeah, here. I knew we wouldn't get. I knew we'd just do a few. But, but do, would we have a homework assignment for shy people who are watching the show, like maybe mm-hmm. smile and hello practice? Yeah. Do you want to explain that, or do you want me to? You go ahead. Okay. Yeah, that's a great intro technique for any type of. Um, social discomfort or for anyone who wants to start trying to put themselves out there more. And it's very simple. It's the idea that to do smile and hello practice, you literally are going to walk down the street and do your best to greet people, right? And that means literally make a smile, give a head nod, try a hello or a good morning or a good afternoon. Um, I have folks say all the time, oh, I live in New York City. I could never do this. People would like punch me or something. And I, I, I think then they'll go do it and realize actually it's just fine. You know, the, the worst case that happens is actually that people kind of ignore you, right? That they just don't don't respond to you. And that's fine. You could even tally, you know, how many people give you a positive response, a neutral response or a negative response. 
But the idea is just to put yourself out there and try to make that connection with people. And often the data shows that people have a very positive response. And you notice actually other folks feel kind of brightened almost by having been greeted. You know, they feel kind of seen and acknowledged and it can have a really nice impact for others too. So it'd be a great exercise for those of you who find maybe some of these others to be too much or overwhelming. It would be to start with smile and hello. And so should they say specifically, do they have the assignment to smile and mm -hmm. say hello to 10 strangers every day for the next week? Yeah, that's great, David. Yeah, that'd be a great idea. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. When I did it, I was so anxious. I started out because I thought I couldn't smile. I had a smiling phobia. I used to have a camera phobia, too. I had all kinds of social anxiety. So I started out by smiling and saying hello to inanimate objects. Uh -huh. uh, just like a tree or a uh -huh. fence or something like that. Yeah. And then once I got used to that, I, I started smiling and saying hello to animals. And yes. dogs are really good because yeah. they'll, they'll lick your face. They're very <laughs> non-judgmental. And then I started, uh, hi, hello, all you. I can do it now. You, <laughs> smiling and saying hello to, to, to strangers. And it's uh, extraordinarily challenging to shy people, but it's a, a tremendously helpful pr practice technique, a good a good first step. Yeah, it's really important. Yeah, it's a great one and a great one to assign to clients for those of you who are therapists. So, yeah, well, I don't actually see a lot of questions coming up in the box, although I'm not the expert of the comment box. So maybe folks aren't don't have specific questions and we should maybe honor the time. But of course, I'd be happy to come back or if folks want to learn more. I mean, there's been talk that I, I should do like a two hour webinar or something for Feeling Good Institute on these skills. So that might be coming down the road if there's interest or if folks yeah, want sure. to hear more. But um, more than two hours, I'd say do a three hour. Yeah, three hour one, okay. You need, need the time, but we have Kathy, Q&A here. Kathy Leffler, I told my boss he looks good in his blue shirt. <laughs> was, was that inappropriate flirting? And there is a correct answer to this wonderful question and Angela will now state what the correct <laughs> answer is. I don't. I, I, um, the, uh, la, 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 I don't know the correct answer. Probably the correct answer is there's no such thing as inappropriate flirting, or I, I don't know. What do you think, David? What is the correct answer? I, I don't know either, but I think it, it can it can be nice to to, to flirt all, all the time, especially if you don't mean it and if you're not trying to lead the person into some kind of an inappropriate relationship. Part of flirting is being kind of lighthearted and not taking everything so 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 seriously, and it can empower you to to be flirtatious to, toward other people and and other mm -hmm. people like it. It kind of puts you in in control, and you know half the time I don't know what I'm talking about, but I, I would say to you it, it sounds it sounds good to my ear yeah uh, you know for what what that's worth let's see I if think, there's some more yeah and i think genuine compliments are just always a great part of our universe right i think it's we could all yeah. do better at giving genuine compliments to people whether we're flirting with them or just being kind human beings so i love compliments being tossed around and wish wish we all did it more when I was when I was at uh, the VA hospital in Philadelphia doing my my research I had to put a grant in mm -hmm. and this fellow in the VA hospital says this is a very passive aggressive system mm -hmm. and uh, uh, your grant will get clogged up with someone named so-and-so this woman and everyone kind of hates her because she's hostile toward ev everybody mm -hmm. however she loves chocolates and if you want to give her some chocolates uh, it's kind of like bribery, and if you didn't want to do it, you know, no one would blame you, but that's the way to get your grant through the VA system. Wow. And so I not only bought it, found out her favorite kind of chocolates, I, I got a box of chocolates, and then I I, I told her, you know, I just th threw a whole bunch of compliments at, at her. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I've heard that you really run the VA, and, you know, what a tremendously uh, mm -hmm. important the job, job that you do, and I've heard some really nice things about you. And within three days, my grant was approved. <laughs> wow. And you know, but it was just kind of I was being you know ha halfway a little fake, but she she really she really loved it. She she mm. probably hadn't heard a good word. You know, she, she probably did have a bad interpersonal skills, and and it you know it can be just really nice to. Uh, you know, to, to send some happiness in, in somebody's direction. Yeah. And, and then I genuinely, every time I, I saw her, she was so happy to see me. And I always like gave her some nice compliments. And, and it was just a really 
a, a great interaction. So I would I would say that could be another assignment is, is you uh -huh. know, throw out 10 compliments a day to, yeah. uh, to, to people. Make them genuine. You'll feel great about them. They'll feel great, right? So, yeah. But except yeah. my point of view is if they're not genuine, they'll be four times more effective. More powerful, yeah. And I'm not supposed to say that because it sounds so politically incorrect. But if you're, if you're kind of playing with somebody, I was treating this overly serious uh, attorney Oh, we're, we're gone over over time. But I told her she she was hadn't had a date. She was a good looking woman, but she was kind of serious and paranoid. And there was this cute guy. She said that she kept seeing in the elevator, and and, and who who was also an attorney. But she was anxious. And I and I said, well, why don't you just compliment him on a t on a, his tie, and then imagine him defending a case in court in his underpants because that image made her laugh so she did that she went up and said oh you have such a cute tie on today and then she thought of that and she started giggling hmm. and and he said well what, what are you laughing about and, and and she said i don't know there's just something seeing you it just makes me feel kind of happy and then he <laughs> said well let's have coffee after after work and then they then they started dating so again yeah. there's something about you know being kind of lighthearted. Really, yeah uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it really helps. So great. Well, it was fun. If folks want to hear more, um, I mean, you can, I guess I can give my email address if it's helpful, uh, or you can find me through the Feeling Good Institute webpage. It's just feelinggoodinstitute.com. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to consult if you're working on this with patients or if you're interested in, in learning more uh, tips and techniques. And we'll post on Facebook if we are going to put together a two or three hour webinar just on this topic. So, and can we, can, is there a way we can post your uh, 12 or 13? Yeah, or I mean, whatever. do you think it's good enough tips? to share broadly like that, David? I was feeling no, that's why we should post it. We're always taking okay. ourselves too seriously. Right. So good point. Yeah. have to be too, too good, right? Yeah. So, why don't we post this? Maybe Lisa Kelly can post it for us. Okay. I don't know how to, or maybe you, you would know how. Yeah, I don't know how, but I'm sure we can. We'll figure that out. Yeah, and I'm 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 happy to share it. I'll just yeah. Yeah, I'll this let go of my ego around it. And let it to, be to practice. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sounds fun. Well, awesome. Well, thanks everyone People for listening. People said they just loved what you're doing, and Angela. They want the webinar. Uh, you know. Uh huh. Yes, Angela, come back. That's for questions same. too, says says Bernie and Craig missed the first fifteen minutes and wants to hear all about it and uh, uh -huh. yeah okay well we're gonna awesome. stop it's 10 after four so we don't want to yeah. hang anybody up Give but i want to thank you, you uh, yeah thank you angela uh, I, I just think you did a great job oh, you're you. awesome as you always are and thank <laughs> you jason for uh for joining us <laughs> for today. tolerating yeah <laughs> he's a trooper that's one reason i like him he he yeah. flirts well too so yeah, awesome. Well, okay. take have care, everyone. In the broadcast. Yeah. Oh. Okay. okay, take care, everyone.